Welcome back to the Bite Talk podcast. My name is Johnny and this is my good friend Zeno. Together we interview some of the most productive people in tech. We discuss tooling, setups, open source, no code, startups, big tech, and much more. Today we have David Gutman. David is the founder of Superstruct. He's led teams of engineers to ship projects like ultra high scale servers handling over 10 billion requests per day and systems that would eventually become Disney.com. He is the author of two popular JavaScript books, Full Stack React and Full Stack Node.js. And on top of that, he's the organizer of JSLA and SpecLA, two popular technology events in the LA community. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> that was a mouthful, David. <laughs> yeah, uh, <clears throat> I have a plate spinning problem. I really uh, <laughs> too many, too many things going on. But really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. No, oh, thank you, David. And uh, like the, I really like your hat. Uh, first of all, for <laughs> those who are just listening to this, uh, he's wearing a JSLA uh, hat. And man. Uh, that's how we met, right? In one of yeah. those events, and I really remember like the feeling of going there, like meeting those other people in the LA, in the LA area. It was not like the super crowded event, but it had like a lot of people at the same time. Everybody like super smart, like a super vibrant community. And I was looking at the site, and I saw that the first event was in 2012. Yeah. So like, how have you been running this wow, for such a long time? I know. Yeah. Can you believe it? We just entered uh, our 10th year. Um, and wow. so, yeah, so I definitely gotten the mm -hmm. similar questions about like, mm -hmm. how have you managed to run it for so long? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. the answer is kind of simple. You just don't mm -hmm. stop. <laughs> <You> just, <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't stop, it just keeps going. Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. Look, I think I think other groups have um, have ended. They've had a, a, a rough time just in general. Like mm -hmm. you wind up, you know. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the the flash meetups that they used to happen, you know, yep. stopped for for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Flash just really <laughs> fell from from its like place of prominence. So sometimes technology can be. Uh, the issue. Um, other times, mm. you know, the priorities shift for the founders um, of the meetup. You know, I, I, <laughs> one thing that happens all the time in the meetup space is someone will be at a company, they're trying to hire developers, and they create the meetup, everything's great, and then that person leaves or that company shifts their focus, and it's like, oh, well, we don't need to hire those developers anymore. Bye! And then, the you know, the meetup ends. Um, things like that. I think a lot of meetups got really hit hard by COVID and the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. JSLA has been continuing strong. In fact, you know, dare I say I prefer it in some ways because it's so much easier to get speakers from literally anywhere in the world to, yeah. to come give talks online. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, hell, living in Los Angeles, just trying to commute to the other side of the city is uh, not fun either. And anyways, for JSLA, you know, one thing that I did during COVID is I built a service called Rambly, which is a location-based spatial audio app, um, which actually preserves a lot of the in-person feeling that I think other meetups just haven't been able to do. Um, a big part of meetups is, you know, certainly the the talks are important. Uh, I know, you know, you know, you gave one of uh, the best talks, you know, we've seen at JSLA, and then that not, I don't <laughs> want to discount that. Um, but the the real value of of an event like JSLA is to meet other people in the community, form friendships, uh, you know, uh, you know, business partnerships, things like that. Uh, you know, start open source or or community things together, um, and that really relies on. Um, those connections and those conversations. And it's really hard to do that, like, on Zoom. Like, if you're oh, on yeah. a Zoom call with, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 people, like, one person talks and everyone listens. Like, it's, it's, it's the most, I don't know, non-organic mechanical process um <laughs> uh, it just doesn't work and so something like rambly kind of preserves it because you can you can all talk at the same time you can walk from one conversation to another in, in an organic way so i credit that with mm -hmm. being able to continue jsla even with such a brutal 
uh, year that we've all experienced. Mm. Yeah, but you forgot to tell the coolest thing about Rambly, which is this RPG setting. <laughs> so you went like Johnny, like imagine this, you enter this space and like you have like your avatar and then you have all these other avatars going like around and then you join the conversations and then you can walk mm. away, go to another. So it's like, man, That's it's such nice. a nice experience. <laughs> and you built that, right? Yeah. How, yeah, yeah, how was yeah, that, that process? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it actually, the very first version I built probably five years ago as a Christmas present for my wife. Um, so I decided like I was going to build her a little mini game where she could walk around uh, as her avatar and then you know, as she walked around the, the world, she would see little scenes that represented like our dogs playing together or like her friend taking a picture or, or you know, these other things. Um, I mean, she liked it, but honestly, it was probably more for me, like, you know, building <laughs> building this game. Uh, and that one was like very heavily inspired by the Super Nintendo game Earthbound. So like an old, um, you know, older, you know, JRPG type of deal. Um, and then a couple years later, I updated it as a invitation to one of my birthday parties. So I, I would throw birthday parties out in the desert, like camping, you know, music, fun stuff like that. And so the invitation was like a scene or simulation as like you were at the birthday party. You can like walk around and talk to people and um, things like that. And then as, um, uh, you know, COVID and the pandemic hit, I was really trying to figure out how to make JSLA not suck online. And I really mm -hmm. did want to preserve the, the you know, the, the talks weren't that big of a deal. Like you could get on Zoom, you could share your screen, and that was Oh, that was going to be good enough because it was your your on stage. You don't really have to interact. But kind of what I was saying before, I was like, okay, how is this going to work? Uh, so the very first JSLA during the pandemic was in March. Um, so it was like right after. And so what we did is after the the talks, which were broadcast on Twitch, we then had a number of Zoom rooms, groups, channels, I don't know, whatever the Zoom thing is called. So we had a number of them. So one we called the stage, the other was the bar, the lounge, the patio. And you could just like flip between them. So the stage is where the two speakers were. So that's where you could like have conversations mm -hmm. with them or hear, you know, like ask them questions. The bar is where a lot of the JSLA organizers were hanging out. And then the other ones were supposed to be smaller. So if you just wanted to like go have like a more private, intimate, I don't know, smaller conversation, you could do that. And it, it was just lame. I mean, it was probably better <laughs> than just like having <laughs> one big group, but it, it was kind of lame. And about the same time, um, like, I, I don't know, I always wanted, I don't know if you, it, it was actually, I think, a, like, a, I'm wearing like a NodeConf shirt, but I think oh, it was no. like, <laughs> once upon a time, one of the NodeConf websites was like multiplayer like web socket thing where like you had a character and you could walk around. Mm -hmm. And so I always wanted to do that with this birthday party Christmas present invitation thing and just never really could justify putting in the work to do it cuz it's like come on like who's like like hey like play this game that has no point mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. and you know, I like uh, what is it? Rec Room and all these VR games had the spatial audio, and so mm -hmm. it kind of was bouncing around in the back of my mind. And what really pushed me over the edge is uh, my publisher, so um, Nate, who runs New Line, just like mm -hmm. messaged me, and he he was like, "Look, you got to just add, you know, spatial audio like in Minecraft to your." game thing like in your virtual world you just have to do it like meetups would be so much better and i was like i don't know like because for me like the idea of really pushing people into using something that i built always felt weird like mm -hmm. like hey use this thing mm -hmm. that i built um and then he was and then i remember it's it's just so funny how my brain works he was like whatever how hard could it be i'm gonna build it i'm like okay fuck i'm gonna like just do this right now like and then <laughs> and then like testing it out it was actually so much better like because so you know i run jsla and this other group spec la so i started using it for spec la i think first to like test it out and then it was just clearly so much better because you could have parallel conversations 
Um, there's sort of this double-edged sword with Zoom. Zoom's really good at echo cancellation, but it prevents people from talking at the same time. Discord kind of has the same thing. Um, and so by not having that, you could have people talk like over each other and you could hear the like the cocktail party din in the background and that's when i realized like okay this is going to be great for jsla and then i built other things like you could embed twitch into it and that also had the spatial audio so the presentations could be within the world itself and added a bunch of other stuff over time and that's kind of how it how it came to be so the magic of browsers and web rtc and uh yeah it's just a lot of web rtc and yeah it, it's you know react it's pretty vanilla though not a lot going on yeah that's awesome and it, i i really like that kind of um creator mentality where mm. you're building new stuff experimenting with new stuff and it's not like you are like pushing it's actually like super cool so you want to just like uh embed that new tool into your world into your community right and uh for those people who are creators and they're building new stuff all the time like Typically, some of them, they'll just drop their projects, right? And that's why I really like your history of JSLA because, man, we're entering the, the 10th year, like your first decade. And yeah. I was curious, like, as you were talking about, like, the, the motivation, uh, one thing that I was curious is, like, what was your motivation back then? And what is your mm. motivation now? Ooh. Is it the same? Or is it like you kept just the same mm. uh, mentality? It's you no, know, it's de it, it's definitely changed. And I remember what what it was um, ten years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I, like I just I don't know if I still have exactly the same mentality. But I think back mm -hmm. then it's just I remember this overwhelming desire to just like like if I'm gonna do something, I want to be the best at it or like be really good. And so I remember, um, you know, probably about the same time that Node started up, um, you know, I was much more into Ruby. Like that was kind of my language of choice and that's what I would build in. Um, but I just saw that all signs pointed to JavaScript, like the, the amount of effort and power that was getting, you know, built up in JavaScript and what you could do in the browser and the idea that you could have these full applications that you didn't need to install. And like, it just made so much sense. And so I wanted like fully switch over to JavaScript. And so for me, that also came along with like, okay, well, who's, who's doing the coolest things in JavaScript? How do I meet them? Like who, like, what can I learn from them? Like what, how do I really get involved in the community and sort of understand the the people and and the i don't know, like i'm forgetting the like the term but it, it's it's sort of like like movements in history with art or philosophy like it's it's really motivated by groups of people and so for me it was like okay who who are these people and like who are they in la and mm -hmm. that's what i wanted like i wanted to be in the middle of like the groups of people that were doing the coolest things with with javascript um and uh over time um you know i just realized i was the best at javascript so no i'm just kidding um but like over time <laughs> uh it became it became less less about me wanting to be the best and caring more about other people being the best that they could be. So it became more about helping people meet each other. The like the strength of the community, it doesn't have to do with the connections between everybody and me. Um, like it wasn't about me being on stage. It was about the connections between everybody and everybody. Like the more fully connected the graph, so to speak, the better mm -hmm. the community. Um, and so it, that was really my you know, driving motivation for, for a long time, you know, very like, you know, kind of pretty quickly. I think the story that I tell that, that what I wanted JSLA to be, or like how I know it was a huge success is in the future, if there were like two founders of a company like GitHub and they were like reminiscing about how they started, they would say, oh, we met at JSLA and we used to hang out all the time. And that's where we got the idea. And that's like where we built it. And so if, 
if a you know a company or an organization so important to developers were to grow out of a community like JSLA, then I would know I succeeded. So it became a lot more about the community itself. And I want to say that's pretty much how it stayed, except I think now I want I want more like individuals to be powerful. I think I get like over time I focused like it was like me and then like other people who were really good. And I think now I'm more thinking about, okay, if you're junior and you're just coming into it, what's the best way to help? And so I think that leads to, you know, things like uh, my podcast, Junior to Senior, which is, you know, you've been, you've been on. Um, and that's really about how to get people on that, the, the lower rungs of the ladder and how to get them up quickly and I think that's that's where mm. I think my mind is now mm. I'm curious uh, about speculate in contrast to JSLA and how if that vision was similar but it seems like you know like going through your bio and hearing you talk you spent a lot of your career investing in others investing in these communities writing books in the podcast which uh, you know other people do that but a lot I mean a lot of people and I think this is natural. It's just kind of like you're just trying to take care of yourself, not even necessarily in a selfish way. You're just like trying to make it, you know, you're trying to be the best you can be and focus on your career and all this stuff. So what was, you know, what has been the motivation to kind of be looking out and like, oh, how can I grow this community or how can I help juniors or provide resources, or that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, so, okay. So first of all, I'll talk about Speculay since you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, so Speculay, another monthly event that I run uh, in LA, I probably started about the same time. Um, honestly, I think it was later in 2012. Um, oh, really? So, yeah. So Speculay, uh, jokingly, but oddly fitting is, you know, the fight club of meetups. Um, we don't really, it's not like a rule that you don't talk about it, but you do, to attend, you have to be invited by a member, which makes it kind of exclusive, so sort of makes sense not to, to talk about it. Um, but, you know, you brought it up and you asked. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the trick with, J, uh, with Spec LA is if it's your first time, like you're invited to the event, you have to give a talk. You have to give a demo about something that you created or built or worked mm. on. Um, it's very much like not a place for tourists like you have to be mm -hmm. you have to be willing to put yourself out there and talk about something that you have invested your time in and it's really a place for creators and tinkerers um people who are naturally curious and will follow that drive um i would say like the like the the perfect person who belongs at spec la is somebody who does the like well that's funny like what why why does that happen and i wonder if i could dot 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 and they're totally okay with blowing an entire weekend's worth of work and maybe like buying you know certain materials or whatever to just figure out if something's gonna work and oftentimes mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know, and, the, and, and mm -hmm. they are they are willing to follow where that goes to try and build something cool. And then oftentimes it won't work and they take a detour and they build something else. I mean, one mm -hmm. of our members, uh, Carl uh, Lautman, he he built a, it was like an M&M sorting machine. I think he did this over 10 years wow. because it's very difficult to create machines that can sort without like crushing. Um, and so there were a lot of hmm. devices out there that, you know, someone would build on a Lark and then you would, if you tried to replicate it or you asked them about it, they'd be like, oh yeah, but it jams like after it's running for like five minutes. But he wanted to know, like, is it really possible to do this correctly and so this was his like white whale for like 10 years building wow. it and investing a lot of time in this problem that he you know a lot of people would be like what that's stupid why are you that like why are you spending your time on this but like he wanted to figure it out so i think something like that you know is is really good and i want to support people like that because i love being around them <laughs> honestly mm. i think that one's that one's kind of selfish is i want to i want to create a space for people like that because they're just super fun to be around the energy mm. is is great um 
And yeah, I I think a lot of these communities that I build, like like it's kind of the same way. I mean, JSLA just started the same way. I wanted to meet those people. If you were in LA and doing super cool things with JavaScript, I needed to know you. Um, and I think once you're in the community and you're building it and you meet these people, then you just start to care about them. And so then you are motivated to do what you can to make them successful. So it's almost like that just mm -hmm. happens afterwards. Um, and then sometimes they spin off, you know, their own, their own groups. SpecLA, I mean, to go further back, um, SpecLA was kind of an extension of, there was a, a monthly event in LA called Mindshare, once upon a time. Mindshare was um, really inspired from TED and uh, another event like TED called PopTech. Um, and so these events, I think everyone's familiar with TED now, so I don't have to give it too much of a, um, a buildup, but it attracted really interesting people from disciplines, entrepreneurs, scientists, uh, you know, community leaders, um, you know, people in the nonprofit space. And it was really awesome to have them come and give the talks, but also have it be a really fun, engaging atmosphere. So in the early days of Mindshare, it had an open bar. Um, it was like really kind of uh, oriented towards singles, I think the like the um, the the tagline was enlightened debauchery. Um, so it was like a fun. It was like very intellectual, but it was um, but it was also really fun. And a part of that was that there were uh, art uh, art installations that were very um, uh, technological in nature. And so the people, you know, I I started creating interactive art installations for this event. Um, so like sound reactive, sound reactive art, um, things like that. Other people who, who came to it would do uh, things with like fire or um, uh, projection mapping, even when that was still like relatively unknown lasers. But they were all they were all very playful. Uh, one of them that, that is the earliest ones that I remember was, you know, the game like Simon, Pocket Simon, where you push the, the, the colored squares and then make the music and you got to copy the, mm -hmm. the sequence of, of notes. Well, he created a gigantic one. So each button was like huge. I mean, it was, it was at, you know, a couple feet in diameter. And so you and three other people had to like jump on your plate to make the noise. So you all had to coordinate like you'd listen wow. to the music and you'd have to know what your tone was. So wait for them to jump on theirs and then you jump on yours. And so it would be, it would be fun things like that. Um, the people who got um, involved in creating those art installations became known as Mindshare Labs. Uh, and we would meet once a month at a bar in downtown LA in this complex called The Brewery, which is a very artistic live work community. Um, and we would meet every month and we would uh, shoot the shit and kind of talk about what we would bring to the next event. And we would sort of one up each other and go to each other into like, yeah, that'd be cool. But it would be really cool if you did this instead. And then we started collaborating on joint projects and things like that. And eventually that became a real company called Sin Labs, probably most well known for an OK Go music video that they did with a huge Rube Goldberg machine in a in a warehouse. I eventually got a little, uh, I don't know, uninterested in the more company-minded version that, that Sin Labs became. And then I created um, Spec LA as a, like, back to basics, let's, you know, drink and hang out and just talk about the cool stuff that mm. we're building. So that's that's kind of where it came from. That's awesome. And I like how... Like this, this transition that you've been through, uh, like the self-motivated, like thinking about you when you created those events and then thinking about the group and then now looking at like those newcomers in the industry and trying to figure out how those people navigate. And yeah, like your, your podcast is obviously super awesome. I think you made, I was like counting the, the episodes. I think you're almost on the 50 episode. Yeah, that's uh, right. right. I'm, almost, I'm almost at 50. <laughs> I think I just recorded the 45th, which is wild. wild. <laughs> this is, uh, you know, totally, 
this was, you know, junior to senior, the podcast came out of uh, COVID. You know, I think a lot of people have COVID mm -hmm. projects. People might have started like baking sourdough bread or whatever they do. <laughs> and uh, a lot of a lot of people, I think, probably started podcasts. And for me, it was because COVID killed Node School. So part of JSLA uh -huh. was running mm -hmm. the LA chapter of Node School, and we couldn't do that anymore. And so um, that was me really thinking about, okay, how can I help those same people um, but you know it also has a big advantage of where it's it's not really tied to one particular technology and I can reach a lot more people than than node school would be able to do which was typically 10 to 15 people like once a month and like from like all of those interviews so far like I'm curious to hear what are the the patterns and the trends that you see uh, that takes those junior people to become senior like what are the things in common that you uncovered so far yeah it was actually something that you said on your episode that really echoes in my mind a lot like i definitely hear like it like really sticks with me which was i think i can't remember exactly what you said but it's like you don't you don't need to be a senior engineer to act like a senior engineer mm -hmm. like there are a lot of these behaviors mm -hmm. that you can do that don't really take a lot of time to develop like you don't need years of experience working on the you know the unix kernel to like know this stuff like you can just mm -hmm. you know show up on time to meetings like you can document your stuff you can be proactive in communication um mm -hmm. and so that's something that i think about a lot because I hear from a lot of hiring managers, a lot of engineering managers, CTOs, they they really care about these skills and these behaviors that are not things that I feel like are really taught in coding boot camps. Like it's it's not how to use MongoDB or Postgres. It's like not how to set up an express server or, you know, use GraphQL. Um, what they're looking for are are people who are going to be really proactive and understand the user a little bit better who are really going to be communicative on the team not be you know jerks during you know code review um there's a lot of there are a lot of behaviors that people who are really new to the industry can can have right out of the gate that make a huge difference on a team and i've also heard a mm. lot of people um say that that's kind of why they like people who who technology is uh, is their second or third career um, because they've developed these these skills mm -hmm. these leadership roles in other industries um, and then it, it really it's it's sort of like jet fuel for for when they do learn how to to code. Yeah, it's so um, funny how uh, like usually the things that like when you're starting uh, this career as a developer usually the things that you believe are going to take you to that level are not actually the things that <laughs> are going to take you there, right? Yeah. It's funny. I'm it's, wondering too... Oh, no, go ahead, Jim. Oh, yeah, I was just thinking like it. it's all those soft skills, right? That almost in every industry, I think when it's a technical, uh, an especially technical path, you can fall into this maybe even more easily. It's like a slippery slope because it's like the technology is all around you and there's so much kind of pressure to be learning the technology well and you, that's your kind of main almost storefront as a for your career for yourself but in every industry like those soft skills go so far and yeah. can really launch you uh not only just into like positions but just in terms of the respect on the team influence your ability to go into other careers all those things because that that stuff translates really easily <laughs> into whatever you want to do yeah a hundred a hundred percent um so the a term that i really liked so i interviewed uh lauren tan um and she referred to them as core skills which i like so technical skills mm. and what we often refer to as soft skills um i really like the framing of of core skills i think that sounds that sounds a little bit a little bit better and yeah they're just so important i mean i think i think you know you 
have an appreciation, I think, more and more for skills like, you know, marketing and, you know, understanding like the, you know, things that make you successful as more of an entrepreneur. And a lot of those skills are super important within a team, too, like just understanding what is going to make a project su successful and not going only concentrating on the code, right? Like, it's almost like skipping leg day. <laughs> like, you don't want to go to the mm -hmm. gym and just like constantly <laughs> yeah. hit the bench press and ignore everything else. Like, that's not going to make you, that's not going to do what you want. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good analogy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that term because um, I've been hanging out with like uh, some friends today that uh, they love Buddhism. And uh, one of the core concepts of Buddhism is like trying to get rid of that duality that we like as a Western mm. culture, we do that all the time, right? We always think about good and bad. We think about soft skills and hard skills. And we, mm. we kind of make those comparisons between them, right? And it's, it's not like that. It's like you are one person, just like with work-life balance, it's really difficult to do because like, uh, I can give that example, right? My dad left um, the hospital after weeks, uh, like fighting COVID, right? And like, man, the relief that I felt today, I can work so much better now because of that. Mm. You know, like, man, even if this interview was like super bad, I was still gonna be extremely happy today, you know? <laughs> oh, and that's, that's the so same. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the case, it's not the case for sure. Uh, but we are one human being, right? And. Mm. Uh, like that's just a part of who we are and i feel like as developers we kind of got uh, like an easy path where we could just say oh no i already know the technical stuff so i don't really need to be uh, polite i don't need to communicate <laughs> well i can just write code and that's it you know and things yeah. are different now right yeah, just mm. go off, just go off to my cave like leave me alone <laughs> and then i'll just like you know, dump it all in one gigantic pull request and like, that's it. You know, we'll just merge it, it'll be fine. What else is there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And man, you've been doing like those podcasts so far, so I have to ask you, right? Do you have any tips for us? Because this is our fourth episode. So uh, yeah, I would love to, to hear. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, <laughs> checklist in the beginning. There's like nothing worse. Mm. Like if you wind up at the end of an episode and realize that your guest has like complete silence and you have to re-record. So probably mm. the, uh, <laughs> the um, you know, the, yeah, although I'll tell you, it was like a better time. Like this, you know, the, the second time around we had that, you know, the first <laughs> one was just practice. But man, does that f make you feel awful. So mm. pre-flight checklist, I think, is is really important i think i you know mine it's, it's just more about starting like i didn't do any fancy intro music my editing is ex extremely light like i mm -hmm. uh <laughs> i just didn't really want anything getting in the way of like any excuse to like not ship mm. i guess so to speak yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah you know i think something that i noticed is that choose guests who you've got like really good rapport with like mm -hmm. that that energy like makes me feel like those episodes are, are a lot more fun and and pretty yeah. great um i don't know those are the things that that stick out in my mind we're now going to take a brief break at the bite cop pod bite talk podcast to do our our pre-run checklist i'm <laughs> no, just kidding <laughs> just in case <laughs> i see the recording light on i think we're good <laughs> yeah, I think we're okay. I think we're okay. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we. Zeno and I have talked about that a lot uh, as we were starting this because, uh, like, neither of us wanted to give much time to this. To be honest, we're like, we want to do a couple hours a week. We really want to do this, but we don't. We don't think you know. We're we're not being um, romantic about how this is going to become and it's going to be this amazing thing it's like we just want to put out something and then we know that each episode is going to be hopefully just a little bit better and we're going to hone it in you know one by one and the first one is probably not going to be our best i actually guarantee it you know so let's just keep <laughs> put something and then keep improving and but it's kind of hard to get over the hump a little bit i, I at least for me i'm i feel like both of you are you've done a lot of different things and you've, you've started a lot of things um 
and I haven't done that as much. So it's definitely intimidating for me, uh, partially from the production side. Uh, like I have a little bit of a background in like film and um, like a little bit of music production and photography. So th- the production element, I wanted to, it's hard for me to put out something that I'm like, I know there's like things wrong with it. But I think for everyone, there's always some aspect of that, whether it's the content or the conversation or like that, uh, that energy, uh, there's always something that you can nitpick. So yeah, I think, I think you're right. Just putting things out and, and then improving as you go and iterating. Yeah. You can definitely get lost in the, uh, in the, in the perfectionism and yeah, ultimately for me, I just, I was just hoping that's just not something that, that the listeners would care. They would just care more that, that it exists and they get to hear the perspective of, of people and, uh, Nobody's really complained that there's no intro music, so I think that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And, dude, I would love to hear more about your books, too. Uh, sure. Because um, I feel like writing a book is something that it's definitely like a milestone uh, in your career. And uh, it feels like extremely intimidating. And the whole process is different from things that you've probably done before. So I'd love to hear, like, for those of uh, people who are listening now and maybe they're thinking, oh, I'd love to write a book someday. Like, what are your Mm. tips for them? Yeah. Okay. Um, So, yeah, I think think kind of like what I was getting at before with the, you know, the once upon a time, I want to be like the best, you know, JavaScript developer or best software engineer, Mm -hmm. whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you can think of like, okay, well, what are those markers? Like giving talks at conferences or running a meetup or having successful open source projects. And I think writing a book, right? I think probably writing like an O'Reilly book is is like a gold standard of like, oh, wow, you know, your you know, your stuff. Um, And so I think it was always always in my mind as like something that was really kind of important and that I would like to have. And um, uh, I was approached by my friend uh, Nate, who uh, is behind um, the, the, the book NG book. So really, really popular Angular book. Uh, and they wanted to do one on React. And um, mm-hmm. so he, he asked if I wanted to get involved. That was, uh, so that one I was a co-author. So there were a number of other authors and I figured like, well, geez, okay. Yeah, like that really takes the pressure off. Like I could just do mm-hmm. my one part. Um, my part was forms, which uh, mm-hmm. I found to be really important. In my view, that's what turns like a web page into a web app. That's the the dialogue between the user and the and the app. So I felt like it was juicy enough. There was enough interesting there. I have particular ideas about you know the best way to do that, and so it was it was very interesting to me. And then also it was this this exercise in discipline which is kind of what you have when the when the motivation wears off like that's that's mm. the only thing that you you have left and so how can you develop that and so it was it's sort of like i don't know running a marathon it's like can you prove to yourself that you can do it can you can you stick to your commitment and deliver something that takes a long time to do and isn't that fun? Like, honestly, writing, I think a lot of authors, I think it's like eight out of 10 authors say that they don't like to write, but they like to have written. And that is definitely, I'm in that mm. camp. Like, I, I just, it was, you know, painful. It's very different than writing, you know, Rambly. Like, creating Rambly, that's fun. That is, I love doing that. Like, the hours fly by. <laughs> writing uh, Full Stack React was very different. Um, and... Now, New Line, uh, so at the time, it was called Full Stack. Nate's company uh, was Full Stack. Um, now it's called New Line. And they have uh, really developed an awesome like way of helping first-time authors. The, they have a very good uh, process um, for how you do it, how you research it. They used a lot of the, um, the learnings from writing NG Book, uh, and that is that's great for a first time author to have your publisher be like okay here's how you write a very useful technical book um that's awesome uh and just to like give people some idea they they might even honestly Nate might have some of this stuff online um for people to see just 
uh, anyway. Um, but you know, a big part has to do with the the outline. Like, don't mm-hmm. like nail that down first. Like the the table of contents, the outline. Really figure out end to end what you're going to do. Um, do a lot of the research first, and then when you're writing, you don't want to go off researching. Once you start writing, you don't want anything that's going to take you out of that flow, out of that zone. Um, you really just want to have everything at hand so that you can just go. And that's that's also really important. For me, it was also that, you know, once the motivation wears off, it's that discipline. Like, how do you how do you keep this going? And so for me, it was developed kind of a ritual of doing it first thing in the morning. Um, I would use the Pomodoro technique. So if people aren't familiar, that's the, you know, you set a timer mm-hmm. for 25 minutes. And then while that timer is going, like every distraction is clear. And so at the end of 25 minutes, you can check your phone, you can check Slack, you can check your email, you can get water, whatever you wanted to do. Um, so 25 minutes on, five minutes off, 25 minutes on, five minutes off. At the beginning, you set you know the, the title or the intention for what you're gonna do. So like that's what you're working on for the full 25 minutes. You're not multitasking. Um, and I actually created an app that would track my Pomodoros so that um, I, actually I did this for full stack node. I didn't do it for React, but I could keep track of how many I was doing each week so that I could just visualize like if I was doing enough of them. Um, and, and yeah, so it was really that like ritual, developing the habit of doing that uh, to really help build up that, that discipline. And the idea is like, if you really just, if you show up and you do it, enough you'll get to the end you know you just one step at a time like kind of like a marathon you just keep going and you'll you'll get to the end but it's so so easy for you to lose that motivation and be like eh, i'll get to it tomorrow i'll get to it tomorrow and if you don't have like a real deadline or like somebody nagging you or something like that you can just you can let it go and never never finish once the the fun wears off so that was for both books that was really important to me it was just the like okay gonna like do you know, an hour today, an hour tomorrow, two hours the next day, like fit it in where I could and just try and at least have that like morning ritual. Um, and yeah, eventually got, got through it and glad that, uh, to have written. <laughs> <laughs> what well, what was the motivation? Like, was it to get that feeling at the end of like, I want to be able to say I've written a book. Was it to share the knowledge? Was it to learn yourself? Was it, you know, yeah, um, I would say <clears throat> I would say for the first one, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, for the first one, it was definitely to, to, to be able to say, like, like, I'm like I'm an author, you know, that, that I've done this. I'm capable of this. Um, I don't think it was as much of a like, this is how I want people to learn it. But I think that was also there. I, I think a lot of my complaint with with tutorials and things that are out there is that they don't they don't do it in a way that I particularly agree with. Like I I, I feel very strongly that you want people to to make very clear incremental progress in a way that is useful to them. So a complete opposite would be the way that I think like definitive JavaScript works. If I remember correctly, it's, it's kind of like, cool, let's go through like strings, like now arrays, Mm -hmm. now objects, you know, it's just like, there's no payoff, you know, it's just dragging you through. And like some other things are like, cool, now let's like install Babel. And like, now let's configure Webpack. And now let's like set up your tests. And it's like, what? No, like, this is not what anyone wants to do. Mm -hmm. Like people want an app that does something. And so, I always want to really show or like show some capability very clearly. And like, here's how we add this. And then maybe I'll say a little bit of like how it works behind the scenes. But like, so I did have a little bit of motivation to to do that. But yeah, if I'm being honest, I think it was much more to show that like I could do it, you know, for myself. And then so after the first one, it was a little bit awkward to to refer to myself as a co-author. And so I was like, well, crap, now I got to do like a whole one. So <laughs> that's like not awkward. <laughs> um, that's, that's great. Yeah, I'm like now you have a podcast. 
you organized a <laughs> meetup for 10 years you wrote books you know like honestly like you have like the resume and you have the network to be anywhere you wanted to work at right uh so i'm i'm wondering like why have you decided to like create superstruct and what it does mm. like i'm super curious about like your day-to-day -day nowadays yeah i mean it's it's interesting i mean i i don't i think i've always been afraid of the like the like the fangs like i think i've always been afraid mm -hmm. of those interviews like regardless of what my resume actually looks like um you know speaking honestly i think i've i've never really wanted to like put myself in those positions even when i used to have like a lot of love for google which i mm -hmm. whatever i'm not going to finish that thought but um <laughs> Um, like, but the other problem with going to a lot of companies, and it's so funny saying this now, like, which, uh, which you'll, you'll hear, but like, I've been working remote for, you know, pro over 10 years now. Um, and so the idea of actually having to go into an office, like, like a Google, um, type company where they really want you in there, right? That's the whole, that's the whole draw. Um, you know, they want you in there and that just i think was never going to work for me like the the idea that like i had to go and commute and also like i love my house i love my neighborhood and like i'm not like if anybody knows the the geography of la getting from los Feliz to venice is like you need a helicopter like if you really want to do that and not go <laughs> insane and there's just like things like that were like off the mm -hmm. off the table even though i think uh -huh. there were some things that i liked about that um the 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 idea with superstructs is really thinking about what like what that would be like versus it, because I, like I've always been entrepreneurial like I, I had a startup like a long time ago um, but the idea of like okay if I were to do a startup what what would my startup be like what would that product be like. What would in getting investment be like? What would I be signing myself up for? Um, was kind of difficult for me to really ever picture. Um, not ever, but at, at the time, like when I was deciding like what I was going to do next, that eventually became spoiler superstruct. But um, when I was thinking about that, it was like okay, or I could join another startup and. Mm -hmm. For that, I mean, it, it, it's weird. It, it almost became like financial, like the idea that like, oh, OK, mm -hmm. I could be I could join on as an early CTO, um, mm -hmm. something that, that I like. I like startups. I like, you know, the early days. I like setting things up. But the idea that like, you could go in and even if you were super early, like the amount of equity that you got compared to the founder, even though you'd wind up building everything was so small that it was like, this doesn't make sense. Like, this is stupid. Like compared to the founder, you know, or the, the investors joining an early stage startup just did not make sense for me as a CTO. And I wound up turning down a couple of offers in that, in that vein. Um, then I think I just got really interested in the idea of productized services. So if people aren't really familiar with that term, a product is pretty well known. The idea is that there's very limited customization. A lot of products you take directly off the shelf. There is a price and you pay the price. There isn't really negotiation. You don't really walk into Target and start haggling over how much you're going to pay for, you know, a you know, an air bed or something like that. Um, air mattress, whatever. I can't even speak. But, you know, like you, there's no haggling over the, the product. Certain products like cars, you do wind up in that situation, but there's a lot of wiggle room and, and, and then you do wind up with customization. But I would say that's kind of the extreme end of products. On the opposite side, you've got services, which often wind up being 100% customizable. They wind up having very high profit margins um, because you are, you tend to be unique. Um, you know, what you are offering, you are not, it's kind of the opposite of being a commodity. However, they are very high touch, high effort, and um, you don't really build up a lot of 
I don't know, expertise or intellectual property necessarily, the more, uh, you know, ad hoc um, those services are. And so I was trying to figure out what is a company that I could build that is something in the middle, where I could build something that is repeatable, that I could build expertise, that I could um, sort of capture that institutional knowledge and that know-how know -how and make that stronger over time. Um, but not do a full product because there's also this continuum of on the product side there's a lot of upfront investment um so a lot of um you know fixed cost upfront for r d and building it out so something like rambly yeah. you know that'd be a lot of time or any kind of SaaS. you build you build and build and build and then you're trying to get in front of users and um sure you you can adapt and things like that but product market fit is difficult services uh, are kind of the opposite. It's more like, hey, I really want to work with you. What do you need done? Like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Like, whatever you want. Like, I, I can make it happen. Um, and so you wind up being really flexible. Productized services in the middle is more along the lines of here's the menu of things that I can do. And you can choose which one of these predefined services that I can that helps your situation. Um, and so Superstruct is me recognizing that I became really, really good at building teams of distributed software engineers from like literally all around the, the world, finding the individuals, bringing them together, setting up the team culture, figuring out how onboarding works and getting them productive very quickly. I just became really good at that. And so what Superstruct does in more of a productized way is, all right, you want a team of four engineers? The custom part is like, okay, what are you looking for? And then I can build you mm -hmm. custom coding challenges that fit your exact roadmap. But a lot of the other steps are things that I have already built out ahead of time, which is mm -hmm. advantageous for the client because it is a proven method and a lot of things that nobody would be able to do just on the fly, um, you know, like onboarding scripts and hiring scripts and um, just the tools that you use for check-ins and and one-on-ones and team meetings and um, things like that. Like, I just give you, like, it's all mm -hmm. just there. Um, and so, you know, I can I can have part that's custom and then the other part that, I build up and get stronger and stronger over time. It is more repeatable and uh, has, I guess, a lower marginal cost for me. So you are there for that formation step and then you leave? Or mm -hmm. do you like continue to build the product uh, with that team? No. So the, the, the mm -hmm. kind of the whole idea is that this is actually a reaction to agencies and dev shops that I think a lot of companies have bad experiences with because their interests are not typically aligned with yours um mm -hmm. and it's it's cool. hard because that's that's the the incentive and the, the the incentive structure is it tends to be all wrong like if you're paying them by hourly like they have an incentive to bill more hours um you know mm -hmm. i <laughs> there's kind of a um you know a story of somebody that that i know um jonathan stark he's, he's actually pretty well known for for his crusade against hourly billing because he recognized he was at an agency where they they effectively wanted to fire their most productive software engineer because he wasn't as profitable you know the the engineers that were slower and had more bugs led to more hours and it's it's just it's wacky. And so I never want to be in crazy. that position, right? I never want to be mm -hmm. like, yes, let me build you your team. And as long as you're using us, like I keep making money, like I take a cut, like I don't want that permanent tax in there. I want, mm -hmm. I want the transformation in the client and then for them to have that power and me to be able to, to leave because that leaves them in a, in a better spot. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really interesting. What is, uh, You've been CTO multiple times, and, and I'm sure a bunch of, you know, different uh, individual contributor roles before and and founder. What's your favorite role uh, of all of them? What have you enjoyed the most? Oh man, um, I mean, I can't tell you how often I just fantasize about being an individual contributor. Like like <laughs> I, like like nowadays, like I just think like. Wow, like <laughs> to think that I used to just be like, like do planning poker 
and like <laughs> and like like yeah, I'll take these tickets. And like that's all uh-huh. I had to worry about for like <laughs> two weeks, like during a sprint. Like, wow, like that <laughs> would be oh, that's that sounds like vacation to me right now. Yeah. Um so I don't know if it's realistic. Like I might just like be bored out of my mind, like if that was the case now. Um but like I fantasize about that. I I'm sort of an interesting case. Like I really love engineering management, but in the way that I mm-hmm. like I like setting it up. Like the the you know, there's the movie the the founder about the founder of McDonald's and you know, he really liked figuring out the process and the best way to run the kitchen and the business and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot, um, my background is actually in economics and psychology. Those were my majors. So I think a lot about how to make engineers productive and how to run teams and to how to help them. But like, it's so funny, like the the engineering managers that, that work for me, like, I think they're so much better than I am. So it's like, I, 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 care about it but like i am such a suck ass like cheerleader like i'm i'm much like i don't know i'm like i'm just not like i'm not that type of manager and people like engineers like me they kind of wind up liking Mm -hmm. that strictness Mm -hmm. um like i hear that a lot in in you know the when you know they they talk about it but even still it's like i kind of feel like they're they're missing something so like the engineering management role there are things that i like about it but ultimately probably not like uh like a perfect match for my my Mm -hmm. uh personality but and then the CTO role, um, I like it a lot. I like it a lot, but it is a lot of responsibility. Like it is, it's um, like you're just like there's no one else. Like whatever happens, like it's gonna wind up in front of you, and you're gonna have to deal with it. And it doesn't even it doesn't matter. Like you have to get it done. Like there is no there is no anything else. There is, it, yeah. yeah. And so. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, kind of comes like double-edged sword. Like, it's pretty great. Yeah. Like, I remember I used to really want to be the CTO because I got tired of people telling me, like, how to do things and they were wrong. And then you get, you know, to be the CTO and, and um, sort of just, I don't know, reminds me of that, like, fable proverb where, like, the, the mountain, like, the, the, you know, the guy working in a quarry, the rock cutter, he's, like, chipping at the mountain. He's like, God, I wish I was, like, stronger. I want to be the prince. And it just, like, goes through. The prince wants to be the sun. The sun, like, gets annoyed by the clouds and the wind. And the wind gets annoyed by the mountain. And then he's the mountain. And then, like, the dude's, like, chipping at his foot. And he's like, damn it. Um, and so, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for you. It's just, like, <laughs> yeah. That's great. <laughs> Well, uh, a little bit, a little bit easier question to close <laughs> us out today. Uh, what is your like? What's a, I don't know, a, an app or even a like it could be software, hardware, service, whatever, uh, on your desk that you're like loving right now, or is making you more efficient, effective. Oh man! So I, I love my remarkable. Like if you you know, mm. so like the e ink. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, what should I call it? Um, mm-hmm. Notebook. I love it way more than I thought I was gonna like it. It's like, what the hell? This is as, as expensive as an iPad and like so, like yeah. you know, way less features. Um, but there's something about that stripped downness and like having unlimited paper, like an unlimited mm-hmm. notebook, and you know that like you know easily sends to the computer and syncs. And so like my my ability to write. Um, like it's funny it like it it like kind of breaks that resistance like oftentimes like you have that feeling where it's like oh, i don't want to do anything but i should be productive like this makes it so easy to be like fine i'll just like sit outside it'll be nice and i'll just like journal for a bit or like like i don't know doodle on like a like a you know a blog post or something like that and it's really nice to kind of break that resistance um kind of the other app that oddly came to mind 
uh, probably just because we were talking about managing engineers. Uh, I think stand uply is so important. Um, hmm. I think a lot of stand ups are just a waste of everybody's time. Um, like they don't need to be synchronous, but I think they're really important. I think probably one of the most important things an engineer can do every single day is to really set their intention of like, if nothing else gets done today, here is what I am going to mm. get done. More of like the output. Like here is the mm-hmm. change in the universe that that is going to like exist because of you know my work today. Um, mm. And I think it's really important for engineers to separate like the effort from the output and just concentrate on like okay, at the end of the day, here is this output that's going to exist. And even if I am taken up in the rapture and my laptop disappears, this will be the difference in the universe. Like as the result of my work at the end of the day. Um, and so something like stand up Lee or any other kind of habit that you can develop where you can like set your plan for the day and then review it tomorrow and see how you did. And mm. then constantly do that, like aim, so fire, calibrate loop, I think is incredibly mm. effective. And so if you're leading a team, I highly suggest uh, stand up Lee because the idea that you should like synchronize and have everybody together i don't i don't think that helps <laughs> david that's, thank that's you awesome. so much man for having a like this yeah. was a great conversation <laughs> i loved it and yeah really appreciate your time this was awesome yeah thank thanks you, for having me on this was awesome <laughs>